morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Will you stand with me as we sing our call to worship, Something Beautiful? We'll sing it through two times. Good to have each one of you out with us this morning. We are thankful for, thankful for the day uh, that we've been blessed with and for the opportunity that we have to come out together together and worship and to celebrate. That's why we're here, uh, because God has done some great things in all of our lives. It may be uh, from uh, saving us and setting our feet solidly on uh, the rock that is Christ and uh, from the temporary things that He blesses us with to the eternal blessings that are yet to come. So, uh, so we gather together today. We lift up His name, and, uh, and we let Him know that we love Him and that we're thankful. Uh, by way of announcing, let me first take this time to announce something that the church has uh, recently done. It's something that we've been working on over the past two or three weeks. Uh, Pleasant Hill recently purchased a sign that's out close to the Brandon Ministry Center. If you're familiar with it, it's over on Veterans Drive. The church that is there is, uh, the name of the church is New Vision United Methodist Church. And New Vision... United Methodist Church was a new church start, a new church plant about seven years ago. And the church has, is dissolving. It has dwindled down. It was up to about 220, and now I think it, it runs close to 30 or so on Sunday morning. And so it's dissolving, and uh, it is partnering up with some more people, and they're going to do a new, another church plant, if I'm not mistaken, in Muscle Shoals somewhere. Um, and that is also the site of the, uh, of the new hospital that's going to be built as well. But anyway, all of this kind of unfolded rather quickly. And, uh, and they, which we had been interested in purchasing a sign. And about six years ago, this, this particular sign was $75,200 that they put up there. And, uh, and they offered it to us for $10,000 to purchase. So we uh, went through the board meeting and... Uh, Pleasant Hill purchased the sign, and we're currently in the process of working with some folks within our congregation to get it moved. So we're thankful for that. It's a great opportunity. Uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. Uh, outside of this particular avenue, I don't know how we would have been able to, uh, to have ta uh, been able to purchase something like this, a sign that's visible from the road, which is where we're going to put it down here. So I want you to know that if you see that, that, that that's the story behind that. And so... We're thankful for those that are in our church with uh, Clint and some others who are working on moving the sign for us and are helping us out in that regard. So uh, we're very thankful for that and thankful for all the ones who have worked to make it possible. It kind of happened rather quick. It happened really fast. It was one of those things where it went up for sale on Saturday or Friday and they needed to know by Saturday is kind of how it unfolded. So anyway, that, I wanted to announce that and let everybody know of that. So it's, uh, they, people will certainly know where we're at now, or they will know where our sign's at, anyway, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, today, between 2 o'clock and 4.30, the churches within the community are having a fall festival over at the, the football practice field. In times past, this is the third year of having it, the past two years, Pleasant Hill's not been able to participate because of conflicting dates. We usually had something going on on that particular Sunday, 
Uh, however, we are participating in it this time, which means this. Uh, we're taking over a couple of games that we use during our fall festival. Uh, we're supplying 75 to 100 hot dogs. They're going to have inflatables. They're going to have a worship service around 430. I believe the pastor that's at the Pentecostals of Florence, uh, their church is involved with it as well. He's going to be speaking this year. Uh, that'll go on about somewhere between 4 and 430. But if you want to bring your kids out, all of it's free, the inflatables. Uh, the games, they'll have a great time. And we, and like I said, Pleasant Hill is participating this time. So if y'all like to come out and be a part of that, uh, your, your kids will love it. You'll have a good time. You'll get to be in fellowship and community with the, with the bigger church body that is in Central. So it would be good to come out and see that and be a part of that. And we're fortunate this year to be able to be a part of it. The last couple of years, we've had some conflicting dates, and uh, we've just not been able to. But thankfully this time, we're going we're gonna to be able to participate and help out in it. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow night at 6.30, we're going to have a nominations committee meeting. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see the, the ones that are on that. It will be, uh, we've got conference coming up on November the 11th, so we're, we're going to start having our committee meetings and get all that in place. Next Sunday night, November the 2nd, I'm going to be starting a revival at Red Bay United Methodist Church. It'll go Sunday night through Wednesday night, and next Sunday night, well, when it starts, the second, our praise and worship band is going to be leading worship there at Red Bay. So uh, I, I'm guessing it's an hour and a half drive to Red Bay, something along that line. We won't be having service here that Sunday night. So if you'd like to come out to Red Bay United Methodist Church and uh, support and participate, uh, you're more than welcome to. If you're not able to come, fully understand. Just keep us in your prayers when you pray. We we'll certainly appreciate it. Uh, by way of announcing... Any other announcements? One more. All right. Over at the other service, I, I gave Kenny this invisible envelope. So, <laughs> but I, I, I want to take just a moment. Uh, Kenny mentioned the blessings we have here, and we're also blessed by having a, a pastor and his wife and children that we truly love they're they're very special to us and uh is eric here also mm -hmm. we're, there he is there he is <laughs> and and we're blessed with having a youth pastor and, and his wife and family uh you know it just having a pastor is one thing but having a pastor with a family that uh is very active and participating in the church is, is another and we should never overlook that uh, October was the month of pastor appreciation and uh, we, we did do an offering last last week and we have the real check you want me to give this to Amy uh, you might want to <laughs> it might be best the real check is here Eric and we love it. thank you so much love y'all so very much We're very thankful and grateful for this. And, and usually during this time, uh, I have received this in the past and said a few things, but uh, you don't get to hear from Amy very much uh, unless you have kids. So uh, I'm going to let Amy take this this morning and let her share just a little bit this morning. <laughs> Those of you with kids hear from me too much. You probably want me to be quiet. <laughs> I want to start by saying how grateful and thankful that I am that God has blessed us the way that he has with where he's placed us. Um, I spoke at the early service and told kind of where my, my journey started to end up where that we are. Um, I was very young and my parents were divorced and I was kind of scattered from one place to the other. And my grandmother was always a constant in my life. And she began when I was very young telling me that there was a purpose to my life and that there was a passion within me that God would bring about one day and that one day I would see what that purpose was. And <clears throat> she started to tell me when I was around the age of starting to date that, you know, God had someone special for me. And then she proceeded to start with this, God's going to send a preacher your way and I burst into laughter I said no way that that's just not me I'm not gonna be that person I don't like to be up in front of crowds I don't 
you know, I just, I felt like I wasn't friendly, like I was just kind of off and hidden by myself, but God overcame all of that with something that he put with inside me that I, I can't hold it in. I, I'm grateful and I'm very, very thankful for where he has led me and that my grandmother's proclamation came to pass. You know, I, I felt, feel like that God worked through her and she kind of kept me centered so that when it come time for God to start using me, that I was there with an open heart. And I'm very grateful for that. And God led me to Kenny and I'm very grateful for him. And I'm thankful that he also answered God's call and that um, we saw where God was leading us together. And yesterday was our anniversary and we've had 17 wonderful years together. And I'm grateful for every one of those because God has used each one to not just grow us personally, but grow our ministry and lead us from a little tiny church in a little tiny community that our first Sunday was nine folks there to where we are today. And we're grateful because God has blessed us with a family everywhere that we've been. Every church we've ever pastored, the people have taken us in and they have loved us like we belong to them because I, I believe that both the other places we've been and here at Pleasant Hill, you're all a big family. And I think that you grasp and you understand what it's like to be a church family. And we're grateful for that, we're thankful for that. We were afraid coming here. I was afraid that bringing three little girls and a fourth child that people would run. Oh, four preacher's kids, no way. And because I grew up with some pretty rowdy preacher's kids, but I'm thankful to each one of you that you've accepted us and you've loved us and we do feel like family and we consider each one of you part of our family and we thank you for not just loving me and Kenny, but loving our kids and helping them through things that they go through. Um, it's been an adjustment for us to have our oldest one in the youth and I'm very, very grateful for Eric and what example he sets before them. If you don't have a child in the youth, you miss out on what a true blessing that he is to those kids. And um, I'm just thankful for where God has brought us to. And we love each one of you here at Pleasant Hill. And we thank you for loving us the way that you do. And we appreciate it very much. And, you know, the best thing is she got to marry a redhead. She said, yeah, she should never marry a redhead. But, uh, but anyway, I'm, I, Amy's right. You know, yesterday was our anniversary of 17 years. And, uh, you know, Amy does, she does a lot. And I'm very thankful for what she does. Uh, and she does it with a willing heart. You know, I mean, not saying that it's not hard. Uh, but she doesn't do it. She doesn't regret doing it or, or do it with disdain uh, or hate to have to do it she enjoys doing it and for that it 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 really makes uh it makes our family better and so we're i'm blessed by her and thank god for her. uh let me ask are there any prayer requests this morning before we have a word of prayer well congratulations He's going to catch you, Harold. Any other prayer requests or praise report? Prayer for Brown. Failed to twist his ankle at work. Uh oh. Prayer for him. Okay. Sure will. Uh huh. Okay. Sure will. The Linville family. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Okay. Keep her family in your prayers. Oh, 
Oh my goodness. Okay. Sure will. All right. Unspoken with show of hands. God knows our hearts, what we're dealing with. Does he have does he have something? Like All right. Well that's good. Luke had a prayer request, so uh, that's that's good. Stand your feet and bow your head and let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together to lift up your name, to celebrate and to worship with friends and family, with people of like, like-minded faith. Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, we know that you're in the midst and we know that you're here today. God, I pray that we don't, uh, that we don't throw this time away, but we make the most of it. God, we accept it for what it is and, uh, and we just engage during this time, Father. Uh, we ask that your spirit would fall upon this service, that it would anoint it and bless it. And Lord, you know the prayer request that's been made known. You know the praise reports that's been voiced as well. And for the unspoken, we place those at your, at your feet. And we ask God that, that you would be present in all those situations. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll remain standing, we'll let the choir lead us in worship. Let us read our affirmation of faith together. Let us read. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
tithes and offerings? bow your heads let us pray the heavenly father we thank you lord for this time together and we thank you father for abundantly blessing each one of us and god as we give to you this morning father we pray that you would take this that you would multiply it that you would just anoint it and use it for the building up of your kingdom father you have uh you've blessed each one of us and father we get an opportunity to worship by giving this morning and i pray lord that we don't hold back in christ's name amen
Once again, let me say it is good to have each one of you with us. We are very blessed and thankful for the opportunity to come out and to gather together and to, uh, like we said before, lift up His name and to be thankful for what He's doing in our life, what He continues to do in our life. This morning, the sermon title is called Broken, and, and uh, we're going to take our text out of Psalm 51 here shortly. Uh, but before we get to the text part of it, I want to explain this idea of, of, of broken. Uh, it comes, we, we can talk about spiritually about being broken in a lot of different ways. Thank you. We can talk about being broken in a lot of different ways. A lot of times when we mention broken, we mention it in the sense of what we are in this creation. You know, we live in a broken creation. You know, the, the best answer to quite a, you know, uh, bad things happen to good people, the best answer to that is we live in a broken creation. That's why. You know, uh, with the tragedies that happen, all the things that come along that we look for explanations and we try to find answers and we try to find reason and we try to find purpose, the reality is that we live in a broken creation, amongst a broken creation, and we're a part of it. That's why we fight our flesh as much as we do. That's why we battle the lust of the flesh. That's why we battle with things like pride and things like greed and being drawn to the things of the world and anger and so forth and so on. It's because we're broken. In a, in a state of which we're not broken was in the, in the state that we were in before the sin in the Garden of Eden. But because of that sin, we're in a broken state. Now what Jesus does is Jesus restores us. He redeems us. He reclaims us. And, he, and the, the uh, brokenness as it's being healed, well, that's called sanctification. And as we go along our way, He heals these broken areas of our life. He gives us strength to overcome certain things that we deal with with the flesh. He gives us strength to pull away from pride or to lay, lay aside our greed or not be drawn to the things of the world. That's the healing that takes place through Christ. And, and sometimes some of that stuff happens overnight. But a lot of times it takes a lifetime for these healings to take place. But there's a different type of brokenness that we're going to talk about today. It's not necessarily the type of brokenness that we have or that we experience because of creation in general. It's the brokenness that we have when we come to Christ. You know, because when we come to Christ and we give our hearts and lives to Christ, one of the things that, that He asks of us or that He desires of us is to is to give Him all that we are, is to be, to be poured out, in a sense, to not hold anything back, and to be broken uh, in His presence, to be fully revealed to Him all that we are, not holding anything back whatsoever. And, you know, and it, it's hard to explain, but I think we know what it is when we experience it. I think we have all probably, at times, spent in prayer and not truly revealed everything that we are to Christ. I think there's probably been times in our life when we have, you know, uh, maybe prayed for the repentance of a sin in our life, or we have prayed for maybe some financial help, or we have prayed for families to be restored, or we have prayed for, you know, to help overcome anger issues, or whatever it might be, but not be fully uh, open about what's going on in our life. And so when we come to Christ... One of the things, if not the thing, that Christ demands of us or asks of us is that we be fully uh, open about who we are, what we are, and what's going on in our life. In other words, be broken before Him. Now, a lot of times people don't like to do this, and, and sometimes it's a difficult journey for us. And so it comes about in different ways, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. There's two particular types of ways of which we see brokenness come about in our life. There is uh, one image that I want to show you. If uh, Tim, if you'll put up real quick. It's the Jesus scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not that one. <laughs> mm, thank you, though, Tim, for go ahead and pointing out our second way of being broken. That is the second way of which we tend to be broken. Uh, th this, this is the first way of, the, of fully submission, right? We surrender to who Christ is. We surrender to God's plan for our life. And we fully pour ourselves out. That's what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus does not go up to Peter and reveal everything that he's dealing with to Peter. He doesn't go up to Matthew. He doesn't go up to Mark. He doesn't go up to John and say, here's what I'm wrestling with. Here's my problems. Here's what I'm dealing with. And fully reveal everything. But 
in a time in the garden, alone by, with, uh, by himself, in a time of prayer, he pours himself out to the Father. Here's everything that's going on. Here's the problems. Here's the troubles. Here's, here's the, uh, the unknown that might lie ahead, whatever it might be. But we see Jesus willfully submit, willfully give himself to the Father, and that is surrendering. It's allowing ourselves to be broken in the presence of the Father. Now, the other way, as we've already shown, is this bucking horse here. And, and, and Clint and others can probably tell you how to break a horse better than I can. I'm not even going to attempt to. But I knew you know at times, I have been that horse, I think, a number of times. As God has tried relentlessly to get into certain areas of my life, and I have resisted with all that I am. I believe we've all done that at times in our life. Maybe we've turned over our relationships, but we're holding back our finances. Or maybe we've surrendered our finances, but we're holding back our relationships. Maybe there's things in the world that we're drawn to and that we don't want to let go of, and we're constantly feeling the pressure of God breaking us, in a sense, to the things of the world, and in pride and greed and all of those things. And so the example that I want to read to you today, if you go to the first passage, boy, he's having a time, isn't he? The one I want to read to you today is in Psalm 51. And the reason I use Psalm 51 is because David has experienced both of these. David has been a man who has fully surrendered over to the Lord and, and of his own doing and without any pressure, without any trouble on the outside or without any duress that has been brought on to him by his decisions. Early on in David's life, David would willfully surrender his will over to the Lord. I mean, as a young shepherd, he would, he would come before the Lord broken. He would come and he would talk about his fears. He would talk about his concerns. He would talk about the things where he was having trouble. He would talk about all these things. He would celebrate and he would rejoice and he would sing. He would come before the Lord completely open. But there would come a time in David's life when David resisted this brokenness before the Lord. There was a time in David's life when he resisted being, being that person and and before you know it, David is wrapped up in who he is. He, he's become the king of Israel, and, and, and while he's been king, he has committed all these different type sins. And now, now David is feeling a brokenness that has happened under the pressure of what God is doing in his life. And there's a big difference between the two. And, and like I said, it's hard to explain but I'm guessing most of us know what it is. Let me read Psalm 51. And I want you to listen to David acknowledge the pressure that he's feeling and the brokenness that he is feeling that has been brought on, according to David, by God. God has done the breaking in this part. Listen. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, of course, hyssop was something that they used. It was a like a weed that they would use to wash their clothes with, and it would infuse certain scents in it and so forth. But when they purged it, they would hang their clothes up and they would take that weed and they would whip it like they would a rug. It would beat the dust out of it. But they would also immerse this scent that come along with hyssop. And David is, is, is asking for that. Listen to verse 8. Make me hear joy and gladness. Now listen. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. David identifies that God has broken him. He identifies that. He, he identifies the fact that God has broken him. And David is in a broken state before the Lord. And it's a different type of broken state that he was in, say, years ago as that young shepherd boy kneeling at, the, at an altar that he might have built to the Lord. This is a different broken state than he was in as, as the image we saw of Jesus kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane, pleading over things that are going on. David identifies that God has... Uh, acted in David's life to the point to where he has brought about brokenness in David. And now David is, is broken before the Lord. He's broken before the Lord. David says, the bones that you've broken. Of course, that comes from this, this shepherd imagery. See this window here? You know, the, the story is that they would take lambs and if the lamb would run off over a number of times, they would take and they'd break its leg. And then they would mend its leg back and they would carry that lamb with them. And that lamb learned to be very dependent upon the shepherd. That's why you have this image of, you know, Jesus the good shepherd with a staff in his one hand and a lamb in the other hand. 
And on a lot of pictures, when you look at that lamb, one of the legs that you can see is usually bandaged up. So David's request to the good shepherd is, repair the legs that you have broken. David acknowledges that because of the things that have gone on in my life, because of the decisions that I've made, and the journey that I've taken, God has broken me. And as I said before, there are a couple of ways to come before the Lord broken. This way is very painful. Listen to what he, let me go on and say. It says, create in me, or it says, purge me with his sop, hide your, uh, verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Uh, verse 10 says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. It says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. We know David was, was guilty of murder. It says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Listen to what David says in 16. He says, you do not desire sacrifice, because if you wanted sacrifice, I'd give you sacrifice. He says, uh, you do not delight in burnt offerings, because if you want to burn offerings, I'd give you burnt offerings. What you want from me is a broken spirit. It's what you want. You want a broken spirit. You want a spirit that is poured out, that, is, that holds nothing back, that is fully open, reveals everything that's going on in my life and, and the things that, are, that he's dealing with. And finally here, he addresses all of those things. He talks about bloodshed and he talks about the things that he's been involved in. He talks about sin and he talks about the, the rebellious state that was working within him and the things that unfolded. And he says, out of all the things that you ask from me today, if it was sacrifice, I'd give it to you. If you wanted money, I'd load you up with money. If you want to Possessions, I'd give you possessions. But what God truly delights in is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And that's what He wants when we come to Him. He doesn't want us to come to Him acting as if we've got it under control because He knows better. He doesn't want us to come to Him acting as if we don't need Him to hold us up because we do. He don't want us to come to Him acting as if we don't need Him to, to make peace in our life or to, to, to restore us or to make things better that... Uh, he knows what we stand in need of. He knows exactly what our life looks like. He knows what's unfolding in our life. And he wants us to come to be honest and to be broken before him, acknowledging that we need him. When I was growing up, my mother used to say, uh, when my attitude would get a little out of kilter, which was very rare, <laughs> seldom ever, but on a rare occasion when it did, my mama would often say, You've got two options. You can either change your attitude or I'll change it for you. That's what she'd say. She said, you've got two options. She says, you can change it yourself or I'll change it for you. And she would always follow it up with, and I'm well able to do that. And she was. She was very, she could change your attitude quickly. And so you have to, you had, to, you had a choice to make. Am I going to wait for mama to pressure me in the way of which she would to put a smile on my face and a thankful heart? Or was I going to go ahead and willfully submit myself and change my attitude this, and, and, and be that that I'm supposed to be? I believe it works the same when it comes to the way God deals with us. I believe God calls us and asks us, just out of wisdom and out of the leadership of the Spirit, I need you to change this. I believe He calls us. I believe He directs us. I believe He informs us. I believe He lets us know in our life that these parts of our lives need to be broken, and, and, and we need His healing, and we need this. And, and you have an opportunity to willfully bend those knees and bow your head and lift up and, and fully submit. Or, I can persuade you later on to make those changes. I can pressure, I can duress. In other words, you can change it, or I'm going to change it for you. Now listen, the Bible says that God supplies our every need. If we need to be broken, He will supply that need. He will supply that need. If we need to see the error of our ways, He will supply that vision. 
If we need to see how much we need Him and how much stronger He is than we are and how little we really know and we've got in control, He will supply that need for us. You know why? Because He's a good shepherd. That's what good shepherds do. Good shepherds, they, uh, they, they make sure their sheep are developing properly. Even if that means, you know, the Bible talks about the way that God chastises those that He loves. And he says that you shouldn't run away from it. That you shouldn't wish that he, that he would not do that because he loves those that he chastises. And if you need to be broken in certain areas, trust me, he is well able to provide that need for you. And he does it with pressure from the decisions that we make in life all around us, forcing us to see what's happening and what's unfolding in our life. I want to read through real quick a passage out of Isaiah. In Isaiah, the people are they're going through a, a time of fasting. You know, and, and they're, they're fasting in a manner that is not pleasing to God. They're doing the right things. They're giving up food. They're doing all these things, but they're not doing it for the right reasons. It's not coming from the right place. Listen to the way that he describes it. He says, why have you fasted, they say. Or, no, I'm sorry. He says, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen. It says, why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? Now listen to what they're asking. They're asking God, we have, we have fasted, we have afflicted our souls, and you have not seen us, you have not taken notice, and you have not done for us what we need you to do for us. And look at what we've done. Listen to this response. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure, and you exploit all your labors. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. And to strike with the fist uh, of wickedness, you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. So God is telling them that the reason you're fasting, the purity of it, the brokenness that is supposed to come along with it, you don't have that. You're, it, it's for the wrong reason. And, and listen, before we decide to throw rocks at these folks and determine how bad and, and, and how rotten they were but for asking God this, we have all been down this journey before. Every one of us have at times in our life. And l let me explain. We have all, as I stated before, maybe bent our knees and bowed our head and, and asked God for things in our life and the intent and the purity maybe not have been there wholly. We've all showed up on Sunday mornings to lift up our voice and to give God thanks and to give God praise and our mind be somewhere else, wondering what's going on over here and what's going on over there and who's this and what this one's wearing and where's this one at and why aren't they, da-da-da-da-da. We've all been guilty of doing the things that doesn't fully reflect what's going on in our hearts. And so this is what he's telling them, that a fast in this particular case is to bring about brokenness and affliction to the soul. And so when you come before uh, Christ and you come before the Lord with a fasting going on in your life, you come before Him in a broken state, in an afflicted state. Let me go on a little bit further. He said, this is what it's supposed to be. He says, is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? He says, is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? He says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? In other words, I mean, this is how, this is the type of fast that you're supposed to do. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. It is not uh, to share your, he said, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. God gives them this guideline to go by. But, but don't get lost in, well, this is how I'm supposed to fast, and I've got to give this, give that. Don't get lost in that. Pay attention to the fact that what they were doing was not matching up with the things that were going on in their heart. They were portraying this brokenness, but in reality, they were not coming before the Lord broken. David says that what he desires out of me and you is a broken spirit. And, and listen, let me say, it's, di it, it's difficult to uh, make the confessions that one needs to make while our spirit is being broken. Because when we come before the Lord with a broken spirit, it means we come before Him hiding nothing. Right? We come before Him... Oh, you know, uh, realizing everything. For example, 
you know, uh, as a boy, going to church wasn't something that I found to be enthralling. You know what I mean? And, and, and I have uh, one that is uh, along that lines as well, right? Rhymes with doughy. <laughs> but let me say this. The only one brave enough to make that confession. I think it's a confession that, is, I think it's a feeling that is shared by all at times. It, when it comes to the little ones within the house. But the only one brave enough to make that confession. Because that's not a good confession, is it? We're not supposed to feel that way. You know, we're, I, I certainly wouldn't confess it to daddy and mama. Not to mama. <clears throat> I'll make you like it. <laughs> you know, it, it, but, but brokenness brings about those type confessions. It does. It just, it just calls you to an honest place. You know, and if that place is, you know what, I just, I just don't have the passion and the desire to serve you like I feel like I should. That's a hard confession. But that's what a broken spirit brings. You know, I, I just don't have the desire to, to worship or to be involved in church or to read your word or to study your word or to spend time. I don't know how to love you the way that I should. Those are tough confessions. But that's what he's asking. He's asking for these broken spirits because here's what happens. Go to the next one. If we come with these broken spirits and if we come fully revealing, here's what he says happens. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. He says, you shall cry, and He will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted so, then your light shall dawn in darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. It says, then, it says, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall rise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. Listen, he says, when you come in this broken state, here's what happens. You know, he says that, that you, will be, you will be a light and there will be healing take place. And he says, I will be your rear guard. When you call upon me, I will answer. When you say you need this, I will respond. So when we come to the Lord with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and we offer that sacrifice up to Him, regardless of how ugly those confessions are, regardless of how ugly those prayers might sound and what, truly, uh, you know, what we truly reveal during that time, he says, I will do all this. He will pour into our lives something really special. He will, he will fill us with something as all that other stuff leaves. He will fill us with something wonderful. So this morning, we have a couple of options. And, I, you know, I'm thankful that God will apply pressure to bring about brokenness in our life and help us see Areas that need. I, I can remember. I've told you the story before about my daddy. How he come to Christ, and he was at a point in his life of where, you know, he was uh, family falling apart, and jail, and drugs, and alcohol, and you know, just all sorts of different trouble that you could name it. He was into it, and he was at a place of where he was. He was more than broken. He was. All, well, let me read this passage to you. Matthew 21, 44 says, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. I believe Daddy would tell you that he was more than broken. He was more of the powder sense at that particular time. Those who will willfully surrender fall upon him, and we come with a broken heart and a, con or a broken spirit and a contrite heart. But I, I do want to acknowledge the fact that if we resist to be broken before the Lord, 
He will provide brokenness for us. People don't want to hear that. But let me tell you, that is a loving father. That's what a loving father does. There are times you have parents. There have been certain things about your children that you had to help them with when it comes to being broken. There are times when you had to help them understand about being polite and yes ma'am or no ma'am or we don't say this or we act this way or if you don't change your attitude, I'm going to change it for you. That's mama saying, if you don't break it, I'm going to break it. And God very much treats us along that line. Why? Because he loves us. He says, I know the plans that I have laid out for you and they're good. They're not bad. They're not bad. So when he offers up these opportunities of where we get to come before him and spill out everything we are, he says, I offer, he says the plans that lie ahead are good. It, it's not for pain. It's not for the sake of destruction. It's not to kill you. It's not to destroy you. It's not to hurt you. It's to heal you. It's to heal you. So, as we take time this morning and we get to evaluate where we're at, we have an opportunity today to fall upon this stone willfully and surrender to who He is, what He is, and ask Him to fill our life with everything He is. What we don't want to do today is we don't want to leave here today puffed up with pride. We don't want to leave here today thinking, I got it under control. We don't want to leave here today thinking that it's all within, them, within my grasp. I, hey, I've got this thing. What it, listen, we don't want to do that because He will provide brokenness if we need it. So, I would suggest that we make those changes before He has to intervene and make those changes for us. Because He will. I'm thankful that He does that. Because he loves us enough to keep us. I'm thankful that he does that. But it sure does hurt sometimes. It sure does hurt. Not sometimes, every time. So this morning, you know, and listen, I can understand. A lot of people are going to have issues. Laura, if you want to come to the piano for me. A lot of people are going to have issues with this type of image when it comes to God. Because to them, God is nothing but you know, flowers and nice words and pretty things. But there is a loving side to God, who, which is our Heavenly Father, that is committed to transforming us into the people He wants us to be. And that's not always full of flowers and roses and pretty words. There's some hurt and there's some pain in that process sometimes. But I do believe this. If we won't be like that, I feel like I'm not, like that horse sometimes. We had a, uh, growing up we had a Shetland pony. Matter of fact, we had two of them. The meanest animals I ever encountered in my life. One of them had an eye out. Now, he wasn't just a mean Shetland pony. He was a mean Shetland pony that was a pirate, you know. He had one whole eye out. And he wouldn't turn left to save his life. He had an eye missing. He wasn't going left. He would always go right. If you wanted to go left, you had to go all the way in a circle to go left. You had to turn all the way around right to go. And I mean, and he, he, was, he was absolutely stubborn in so many different ways, so many different ways. You know, it's sad to say, but I can relate to that old stubborn pony in a lot of areas of my <coughs> life. Where God, I hear God keep saying, you, you need to give me that. You need to give me that. If you don't give me that, you're going to regret it. You need to give me that because if you don't, you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. One day you look up and you're regretting it. Listen, this morning we have opportunities, Sunday morning after Sunday morning, to come before the Lord, pour our hearts out to Him. This morning, let's take full advantage of that. If there's anything going on in your life this morning, if there's a time right now that you need to come before Him, lay it all out in front of Him and say, Here I am. You've got an opportunity to do that today. Stand to your feet and let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time together, for the opportunity, Lord, that you have, uh, that you've given each one of us. And Father, I know there are times in our life when we resist.
to be open and honest about who we are and what's going on in our life. Father, I know there's times in our life when we fight. But God, I pray today, I pray today that we let that go and we willfully submit and we surrender to who you are. To what you're calling us to be so that, so that we can be healed. So that we can be made whole. So that we can have the things you've promised that we can have. God, I pray that we don't leave here today thinking that we've got it. But Lord, that we leave here today knowing that we must have you to make it. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for changing us and transforming us. Thank you for loving us enough to stay with us and change us. Father, I pray this morning that we don't walk away from this, uh, but that we respond in a manner of which you're calling in Christ's name. Amen. As Laura plays, I invite you to come pray this morning.